Within days, the crew were suffering from acute radiation sickness. They hurried back to port in Japan, but despite doctor's efforts, the radio operator died. Others took a long time to recover. There was a huge outcry in Japan. I mean, this was the one country that had already been atomic bombed, the only country in the world. For now, some of its ordinary fishermen to come home sick with radiation poisoning produced a national outcry. The remoteness of Bikini Atoll should have prevented such contamination. We asked Dr. Kalinowski whether contemporary records can provide any explanation. I looked at the weather data and I think that is one of the main reasons why the fallout was higher than expected. We're looking here at the meteorological situation of the Castle Bravo test. Ground zero is marked here with a black star. The lines indicating so-called trajectories. So these are the paths that particles would follow within 24 hours after the explosion. The red line indicates a particle 10 kilometers height, whereas the green line is for a particle almost at ground level. The striking fact is that the green line goes into exactly the opposite direction of the red line. The winds are blowing into different directions at high altitudes. The winds are blowing towards the east and at low altitudes towards the west. The Bravo commander expected fallout to blow towards empty ocean. Instead, most of the radiation was carried eastwards high into the air to descend on the USS Curtis, the Lucky Dragon, and nearby islands. The major fraction of radioactivity is transported in high altitudes because the mushroom cloud lifts the radioactivity. I'm not sure whether they missed the information about the wind fields but their impact on the fallout was probably um, underestimated. The radioactive plume caused widespread contamination. On the islands to the east of Bikini, 260 people were quickly evacuated by the US military, but many showed clear symptoms of radiation exposure. Usually before shots, they were very meticulous in predicting what the wind was going to do, but of course, winds can change very quickly. Just unfortunate. There began in this incident a change in the view that the world had of these tests, and to some degree also of these bombs. Bravo was 1,000 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. But as relations between the superpowers reached a critical stage, scientists perfected a weapon of even greater magnitude. In Germany, in 1961, the flashpoint was over who should control Berlin. Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev faced off against John F. Kennedy. Khrushchev decided to do something about it and built the Berlin Wall, which came remarkably close to starting a war. Khrushchev called in his scientists and said, let's show the Americans what we can do. What Khrushchev wanted was a 100 megaton bomb, the biggest of all time. It was a deliberate threat. He said, Let's build a really big one and show them what we can do. The scientist Khrushchev summoned was Andrei Sakharov. The brains behind the Soviet bomb program for the last decade. Boris Altshula studied under Sakharov and was a close friend for 20 years. He didn't consider it as some tool to kill anybody. It was, was a tool to defend us, our country, from being killed. 
Sakharov had three months to produce the biggest explosive device of all time, dubbed the Tsar Bomb, or King of Bombs. It had to be small enough to fit in a plane, yet still produce a force six times bigger than America's Castle Bravo. This would be a three-stage weapon, rather than the two stages of the American bomb. An atom bomb would be the fission detonator, compressing the bomb fuel in first one thermonuclear reaction, but then another. The scientists once thought about making a bomb that would be a thousand megatons, and that would be a perhaps four or five stage weapon to get that much yield. It wouldn't be useful because once you get above a hundred megatons, the fireball is the thickness of the atmosphere of the Earth, 10 miles. And any further blast is just going to go out into space. It's not going to do any good. Sakharov was working under orders. But as the bomb neared completion, he insisted on one vital change. To limit the potential fallout, Sakharov amended the design to 50 megatons. Still, the most powerful object mankind has ever made was now ready to explode. The most powerful bomb ever produced, the Soviet's Tsar bomb, would detonate over the remote Arctic island of Novaya Zemlya. Mainly wilderness, the snowbound territory was far from centers of population to be affected by the bomb's fallout. As dawn broke, the crew assigned to carry out this historic mission were given their final briefing. Mission Control was a military airbase in northern Russia, 900 kilometers from the drop zone. The crew had been hand-picked, and their aircraft had to be specially adapted. The Tsar bomb, weighing 27 tons, had been fitted with a parachute and would be dropped from an altitude of 10.5 kilometers. The bomb would fall for 6,500 meters before detonating. Enough time, it was hoped, for the air crew to escape the devastating explosion. There were real concerns. Sakharov said, now they do something which was never earlier happened on the history and on the Earth. To foresee exactly what will happen, shock wave came to the airplane. An airplane fell down about a kilometer. But it was very high, so they did perish, but it was almost broken. The most powerful man-made explosion in history produced a mushroom cloud which peaked at 64 kilometers, around seven times the height of Mount Everest. Buildings 100 kilometers away were destroyed. Windows were shattered 500 kilometers away. Monitors who picked up the shock wave had been expecting something momentous, but nothing of this magnitude. We were really impressed the fact that they were able to uh, airdrop that thing. And even more impressed when we realized that had they uh, used much more uranium in it, which they could have, it would have been 100 megatons. It was really amazing. The implications were clear to the analysts. If the Tsar bomb were dropped on Washington, D.C. and detonated at an optimum height of 600 meters, the initial fireball would incinerate everything and everybody within 5,600 meters. People 20 kilometers away would suffer third-degree burns. Most buildings 30 kilometers away would be destroyed. 
releasing more than 3,000 times the energy of the Hiroshima bomb, it would kill over one million people instantly, perhaps three and a half million in total. The altitude at which a bomb detonates is a critical factor. Dr. Martin Kalinowski was asked to determine what happened to the fallout from the Tsar bomb. The big difference is that the Tsar bomb was exploded at four kilometers height, whereas the Bravo test took place close to ground. But there is a second issue about wind speeds and directions. This is a snapshot of the plume after six hours. Ground zero is marked here with the red star. Different colors are indicating the part of the plume at different heights. The important thing is there is no vertical transport, neither downwards nor upwards. The whole plume is traveling towards the east. Particles transported with fast wind speeds had no chance to reach ground. It took 48 hours before any fallout reached the ground. By that time, the very short-lived radioactivity had already decayed and the concentrations were very low. The low initial fallout of the Tsar bomb was still too much for the man who built it. Sakharov's own estimate was that 500,000 people worldwide would suffer in succeeding decades as the radiation deposited by the huge cloud slowly decayed. In a remarkable turnaround, Andrei Sakharov became a fierce critic of nuclear testing until both sides agreed in 1963 to a treaty confining further tests underground to prevent fallout. The race for a super bomb was ended, and Sakharov was ultimately awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1975. But the legacy of this deadly contest is still evident on Bikini, which remains too radioactive for people to live there long term. Today, Bikini Islanders live elsewhere in the Marshall Islands, and some of them in the United States. Leaders of the exiled community, including the mayor, make periodic visits. This one, the first in two years. Right now we are at the old graveyard site from before the testing was happening on Bikini. Bikini are all one family. So if anybody dies, they, we all related. The United States has, over the years, paid almost $200 million in compensation and in its attempts to clean up Bikini. But it looks like remaining an island of ghosts. The children of Israel, they travel for 40 years. But children of Bikini, I really don't know if we will ever come back to Bikini. The bombs laid waste one tiny island and helped shape history for the rest of the world. Does the man who played a key role from Hiroshima onwards have any regrets? I never had any qualms that what we were doing was necessary at the time. But I've said many times politicians should have to get in their underwear and watch a megaton blast and feel the heat and really make uh, better thinkers out of some of them. Explore one of British history's biggest mysteries in Ghosts of the Mary Rose, brand new tomorrow at 9. Next tonight, it's the premiere of The King's Speech Revealed.